come to me. Come to Nikki. Come on. Don't make me wait. I remember the uh, editor at the publishing company who first had the contract to publish the novelization of Videodrome called me up and talked to me about it because they had sent her the script as they had sent me the, uh, a draft of the script. And she said, this, I will not name her and I will not name the publisher, but she said, this, the people in this script, the story, it just, it's like they're people on PCP or something. She said, it's just craziness, don't you think? And I said, well, it's very bizarre, very strange indeed. It certainly was challenging. I never specifically thought of myself as a horror writer. I was a great fan of science fiction when I was growing up, and uh, the greatest influence on me was probably Ray Bradbury, whom I read in elementary school. And uh, he just opened up to me the possibilities of language and uh, fantasy, and uh, got me very interested in it. And then when there came to be a, a horror boom uh, in films, uh, I guess, probably starting with Night of the Living Dead and on through the 70s. I became very fond of those uh, exploitation films and the horror films and uh, found myself trying to sell weird stories that I had written. Uh, and the only place that I could sell them was in the horror field. It was a time when uh, things that were too offbeat and bizarre to be published in the mainstream ended up being published under the general title of horror, even though a lot of things that were just surreal, dreamlike, weird psychological things got published as horror. Horror is now today a, a much more codified uh, formula or genre, but at that time it was freewheeling. As a few years earlier, science fiction had been the place where all sorts of bizarre things were published that weren't specifically about rocket ships in the future. But uh, science fiction was a welcome harbor and then horror became uh, for probably 15 years, uh, Welcome Harbor, and it still is in, in, uh, in some places, in some ways. Uh, if I have a really strange story that's not specifically a horror story, it's just odd, I usually end up selling it in the horror field because they're more open-minded. It's a more forgiving and, and welcoming uh, branch, I think, of literature. <laughs> I had an agent in New York named Kirby McCauley. He had been contacted by Bantam Books because they wanted a novelization of The Fog. So uh, I immediately was interested, even though I'd never written one before, because I admired John Carpenter so much. And he was in LA and I was in LA and it was a chance to go and meet with him. And uh, uh, The Fog worked out. I ended up doing uh, novelizations for Halloween 2 and Halloween 3 for him. Then my agent, Kirby McCauley, got a call from another publisher who had a contract to do a novelization for Videodrome directed by David Cronenberg. Well, David Cronenberg is one of my three or four favorite filmmakers in the world. So I said, can we go to Toronto and meet him? And my agent said, yes. So we flew up to Toronto. We spent a couple of days up there, met with Cronenberg, saw different cuts of the film, uh, different versions of the script, and I got to talk to him about it at length, and I thought, how can I resist? This is a chance to, not just to see the film in various stages, but to hear him talk about what he was really getting at in the film. And uh, unlike some novelizers, I didn't do it as a knockoff just for the money. I, I worked with those two filmmakers only on novelizations because I admired and respected them. And it was absolutely fascinating, the conversations I had with Cronenberg. I still to this day don't fully understand everything in that film, but I understand it a lot better uh, than before I met him. <sighs> Ooh. 
Well, interesting, the challenge for writing Videodrome, which was by far the most difficult for me to write of the four that I did, was that Max Wren is on stage the whole time. You follow Max Wren from the beginning to the end of the film. As the way I recall it, I hope I'm recalling it accurately, he is on screen the whole time. We are following his adventure. The problem with something like that, if it's a complicated story or something that's tricky, is that the audience will not know anything before he knows it. So I had to go, I had to do interior monologue in the novel to try to trace his thinking and reasoning, attempting to understand what he was going through, figure out some of it before it's figured out in the film, because the alternative would be to simply end the film just before the end of the film, you're suddenly left with a great mysterious vacuum and someone has to come on screen and explain why. You can't do that. So what you have to do is to either leave it utterly baffling or have, in the case of a novel, you can go inside the character's mind. Ah, he realized, now I see why. You see what I mean? This is all, it's not spoken dialogue. It's what's going on in his mind. But it was so difficult because I had to write the entire novel from his point of view. And I would never try to do that. Uh, I've never tried to do that since. I would never try to write a novel from one person's point of view, unless it's a one, there's only one person that's the last person on earth. But if you're going to have various characters and events, and you have to tell the entire story in terms of what only one character knows, and the story has anything to do with mystery, which means withheld information for the sake of suspense, it's truly gargantuan to try to solve that problem if you're only in the mind of one character. You have to be free to cut away to other scenes that he's not in so that the audience, the reader, will know some things that he doesn't know yet. But in this case, the film, as I recall it, follows Max throughout. So I felt that it was inappropriate for me to invent new scenes that didn't involve Max. So the only alternative was to go into his interior monologue and follow his thought processes so that the ending seemed inevitable. Long live the new flesh. Cronenberg is essentially uh, visually oriented his imagination, very imagistic, very interested in photography and painting and visual arts as well as motion pictures. I too happen to be very visually oriented in my imagination. So I took great care with the images that he showed in the film and the images that were mentioned in uh, the script. His scripts, by the way, uh, are more interesting than most of the film scripts I've ever read. Most film scripts are simply uh, very brief summaries of people entering and exiting uh, in the broadest and simplest possible descriptions. Cronenberg, at least at that time, tended to use a good deal of rather literary description. I can remember one paragraph in uh, Videodrome describing uh, the Debbie Harry character, uh, describing very carefully how she was dressed. And at the end of the paragraph, he says in the script, in other words, she looks exactly like a black Saab automobile. So that was wonderful. He's a, he's a car buff, a car fan. And I thought about the lines and the character of a, of a black Saab at that time. And I got the feeling for what he was going for in the image that she was projecting. But you see, there's an example of using a, a visual image as part of the writing to make the point for people who were reading the script. And I did do uh, his images throughout the book and, and some of my own to try to capture the point because I understood that the point of what was uh, being shown in the film, uh, the story that was being shown in the film, was uh, largely symbolic and largely imagistic. So I had to do it that way. But the things and the objects and the blending of the objects with living flesh is most fascinating. The organic and the inorganic combined, I understand that perfectly. And uh, it just seems perverse and meaningless to some viewers. But then that's not the viewers we're talking to right now. I can imagine that that script may have been received unkindly by other studios that he showed it to earlier. I don't know. Uh, but he's very sure of himself very intelligent, very articulate, and he understands what he's doing. Well, some of it's dreamlike material, he may not understand all of it rationally, but he's coming from an authentic place of authentic knowledge, not just received knowledge, but authentic knowing. 
Uh, I remember after a test screening in Toronto of uh, one cut of Videodrome, uh, he was inviting people, uh, as, as, as I recall it, he, he was inviting people off the street to come in, inviting them to a free screening of, of, of a film that was in progress. And afterwards, in his room, there were two fellows from the studio. And they had a list of about 30 or 40 questions written down on a long legal pad. And they sat down and they asked him each one of these questions, things that they were not clear about in the film. Why does he go back to uh, Pittsburgh? Why did he say that to her if she already knew it? This and that, this and that. Specific points throughout that they had questions about. And they were challenging him. They wanted him to answer those questions. They thought that they were points that had to be cleared up in the editing or the sound recording the dialogue. And I've never seen anyone handle anything like this as well as Cronenberg. He sat there completely nonplussed. He didn't bat an eye. He remained pleasant. He was not defensive at all. He was not argumentative. He simply answered each one of their questions rationally. It wasn't a script that he dashed off uh, overnight. It was something that he'd obviously been working on several for some time and through several drafts. So he knew the answers, uh, and uh, you know. But one of the reasons that he prefers to shoot in Canada rather than in Hollywood is because he doesn't want suits looking over his shoulder and questioning him and saying, "Explain that more. I don't get it." He gets it. His audience gets it, and that's his final concern. He's an artist, in other words. <laughs> There's still things that are mysterious to me, deeply mysterious. I think at the heart of every Cronenberg film, there's a mystery that isn't entirely solved, um, explicated. Uh, so I wasn't trying to simplify and I wasn't trying to rationalize intellectually everything in that film, because there's a lot of very dreamlike and hallucinatory imagery in it. All I can do is to try to find literary imagery that accomplishes the same thing, try to find the equivalent. And what works on screen doesn't necessarily work on the printed page. That gun, for example, that flesh gun, how are you going to write about that? You have to ask yourself, what does this mean and what would be another way of indicating this on the printed page that might have a similar effect? You're trying to find the equivalent because they're two very different media. F literature and film are very different. Sometimes they come close together once in a while, but generally speaking, they work very differently. I once took a novel that I had written and wrote it as a screenplay trying to sell it as a film. And when I was finished, I realized that there wasn't a single scene in the script that was in the novel. In fact, there wasn't a single line of dialogue in the script that was from the novel, because I intuitively understood that what worked in a novel would not necessarily work in a screenplay or on film. So I had to try to find, I had to try to invent new scenes that would make the same points that were made in the chapter of the novel, but make it in a way that was visual playing to a visual audience. I'll tell you, it's an, it's an uneasy mix. That's better. The Videodrome novel was, took longer to write than, than any of the other three. Uh, and it's not because it's better or worse, it's simply that the challenge of writing the entire novel from one character's point of view maintaining suspense and mystery, and not cheat at the end and leave things, important things unexplained, but also uh, not to over-explain and to leave the mystery. I, in, in short, I tried to take this, I respected Cronenberg so much, and I respect writing so much, that I tried to do this with the same degree of seriousness that I apply to anything that just has my name on it, an original work. Uh, I wanted it to be my best work because I've learned the hard way that when I try to do things just for money or just knock something off quickly in order to sell it, uh, it it's competent but it's, it's hardly first rate, it's hardly my best work. The only way, it's a quirk that I have, the only way I can do something that, that, that I feel is good is to, to be emotionally involved in the material I'm writing. I have to care about what I'm writing. So, uh, which is why I never made it as a hack screenwriter. I just simply could not write with enthusiasm and passion about something that I thought was dumb. And that certainly was not the case here. But I tried to write those novelizations uh, 
with the same intensity and, and care that I use on any fiction that I publish under my own name. So far from being uh, uh, something that was done just for money, I suffered like I would, as I would suffer through anything of my own. I wish I had an opportunity to do it again. I don't know of another Carpenter or Cronenberg uh, who needs a novelization, but I would certainly, uh, there are other people that would, uh, would, I would love to work with. But uh, curiously, I haven't been offered any novelizations since then, so I don't know why that is. Maybe they were just too baffled. The imagery, as I said earlier, the visual imagery was just too baffling. After all, it is sort of like a story about people on PCP. Get the video, Joe. Long live the new flesh.